Well, hi, everybody. It's great to, to see everybody, and it's great to be part of this wonderful evening, a Christmas agape latte. I see some faces I know. You know, if you're in my class, you're not getting extra credit for being here. Um, a few years ago, in fact, a few years ago, um, when my son was here, Julian, uh, one of his, I teach a theology class here, and one of his uh, friends, uh, I don't know if it was texting or if it was social media at the time, somehow I saw it. He didn't know I see it, saw it. I'm glad I did. Uh, his friend wrote to him, Julian, I'm so excited I got in your dad's class. And uh, he wrote back, eh, I've been in that class my whole life. It's overrated. <laughs> so hopefully Julian's watching. Um, so this is Christmas Agape Latte. And um, the problem is it's not Christmas, right? But this is a Christmas Agape Latte. It's not Christmas. It's Advent. This weekend, I was sitting at home. I was looking out my, uh, I saw out my front window some neighbor friends of mine uh, riding their bikes by our house. And uh, I made a comment to my wife, Sue. I said, hey, there go our friends uh, on their bike. She jumped up. She ran to the door. She opened it. She said, hi, guys. Merry Christmas. It's not Christmas. She came in. I said, what are you doing? It's not Christmas. What's a Merry Christmas for? She said, I like to say Merry Christmas. I said, well, it's not Christmas. You shouldn't be yelling Merry Christmas through the neighborhood. I said, I like to say it. I said, okay, that's all right. We like to say that. We want it to be Christmas, right? Because Christmas is a lot of fun. Christmas is a great, it's my favorite time of the year. And we have to cheat a little bit here at BC, right? Because you all go away. In, a, in another week or so, you're going to finish your classes, finish your finals. And then you're, many of you, not all of you, many of you are going to leave campus. So we don't really get to celebrate Christmas here on campus with you. So at BC, we like to cheat a little bit. So we kind of move Christmas up into Advent and we kind of mishmash. And so that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Advent, but there's certainly going to be a Christmas theme as well. Um, so we're cheating. But it's Advent. And uh, you all know what Advent is. There's different ways to think about Advent. But Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means a coming or an arrival. So what's arriving? Something's arriving and we're supposed to prepare for that. We prepare for an arriving. We hope, we wait, we expect something. So from the religious standpoint, right? Advent is a season in, in the Christian faith. It's a season that precedes Christmas. From the religious perspective, what we're preparing for is the coming of the Christ. And traditionally, we mostly think about that with the nativity, right? The birth of Jesus, Christmas. That's what Christmas is, right? You remember that? Not just Santa Claus, but the birth of Christ. And so uh, from that perspective, we're, we're preparing for that story to celebrate that story again. You know that story, right? You've ever seen Charlie Brown? And he says, does anybody tell me the real meaning of Christmas? And Linus reads the story, right? It has to do with Joseph and Mary and, and, and they're traveling to Bethlehem and there's no place in the inn, right? And so they have Jesus is born in probably a cave and is put in a manger. And then all of a sudden, we go to the shepherds on this mountainside, and they're up there smoking cigars with each other, just minding their own business, which is what I like to do. And then all of a sudden, the heavens open up, and there's angels yelling at them, and it says they're terrified. Or as Linus says, they're sore afraid. Sore afraid. They're terrified. But the angels say, don't sweat it. Don't be afraid. We've got great news for all of humanity. For unto you is born a child this day, You'll find them wrapped in a swaddling cloth lying in a manger. You know that story. The other thing that we prepare for from the religious perspective, from the religious way of thinking about Advent, is to prepare for another coming of the Christ into our world and into our life. That's the religious part of Advent. The cultural reality, right, of Advent is something that if you celebrate Christmas, you're well familiar with. The cultural stuff is buying a Christmas tree, stringing lights outside, right? Planning travel to go see family and friends, buying shopping and shopping malls, I hope. You don't go there, it's, just, it's an awful experience. But going out shopping and listening to Christmas music and baking cookies and wrapping presents and putting up the tree. All that is kind of another way of preparing for Christmas. And that's something that many of us are a little more familiar with maybe than than, than the other part of the religious part. That's another way of preparing. Then there's the kid reality. Now, what does it mean if you're a kid to prepare for Christmas? 
Uh, right? And so that's different. So for me, if you're talking about Advent and an arrival, when I was a kid, it meant one thing. It meant Santa Claus. What I was preparing for was for the arrival of one dude, and that was Santa. Santa would come on Christmas Eve. He'd come down the chimney or through a vent pipe or in a window or something, whatever your circumstances were. He'd come in, he'd find a tree, and he'd put presents under that tree. And when I, I don't know about you, are you related? Do you remember this story? You know about Santa Claus? Who's with me here? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, wake up, people. So Santa, you're not excited about it. When I was a kid, I would lie, I was one of five kids, and you could have hooked the five kids up, and the electricity coming from our bodies on Christmas Eve would have powered a major city for at least a week. I mean, I would lie in bed, you know, literally convulsing, you know, just shaking. Because why? Because, and, and you know, you, you lose your mind. Like, you go insane. You start hallucinating. You're hearing things on the roof. You know, you're hearing jingle bells outside of windows. And you're telling each other, I heard the bells. I could hear sleighs on the roof. You know, and, and it was very real. And why? You're shaking. I'm shaking. And I saw this with my four kids. And I'm excited because in the morning, I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to find packages underneath the Christmas tree. And some of them are going to have my name on them. And one of them might just freaking blow my mind so out of my head that my life will be changed forever. That's expectation. That's what I was preparing for. When I was a kid, I really thought that maybe something I would get under that tree would be just so freaking awesome that my life would never be the same, right? And sometimes when you're a kid, it does, right? It happens. You get that game, you get a sled, your life has changed forever, right? This is the most incredible day of my life. And for a little while, I mean, you also get snow pants, a book, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, yeah. some socks, you know, but one of those packages might really blow your mind. And when I was a kid, it would last. And it worked for a while, right? It's kind of exciting. And it lasts for a few days. And then you'd realize, eh, you know, pretty much fun, but you'd move on to other stuff. When you get older, right? None of you are, you're not, I can tell you're not, you're not ready to have your minds blown this Christmas. You're already over it. It starts to dawn on you, right, as you get older, that first of all, this whole Santa thing is a scam. And secondly, uh, yeah, you know, it's not much that's really blowing my mind underneath the tree anymore. You know, I mean, it's some nice stuff. I, you know, it's a nice sweater. You know, it's very nice, you know. A book, I like books. I got a really good book, you know, and I, I need some boots. Thanks for the boots. You know, I like these boots. But, you know, not life-changing, not transformative. So what do we preparing for, right? If, 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 if it's not that, what do we hope for? What are, we, what are we expecting? What can we expect that might transform things for us? What could be so fantastic that it could change our lives forever? A few years ago, um, I, I, I think when I was introduced, I was mentioned that I have four children. Um, and um, <clears throat> they came in this order, boy, boy, girl, girl. And um, so a few years ago, just the three of them were around. Um, and I had my, my oldest son, Joey, was four and a half years old. My second son, Julian, who I mentioned a minute ago, was three years old. And our third child, Mary Lou, was just born. And, um, and our, our darling fourth daughter uh, had not yet uh, come to mind. Um, so we were living in Waltham, Massachusetts. Um, in a little tiny house, 800 square feet, I think. And the, the property it was on was not much bigger. It's a fairly urban neighborhood. And um, it was a Saturday morning. And um, it, was, it was springtime. It was nice out. Uh, and I was in my driveway underneath. I, I have a, kind of a series of old Volkswagens. So I was doing, I was doing something mechanical, <laughs> hard to believe, on my car. And my two sons, four and a half and three year olds, are out in the yard. And I'm no, I'm, I'm watching them. I am aware of where they are. 
And uh, they're in their pajamas still, and they're playing, okay? And, and, you know, we're not fancy folks, right? They're outside. They got sticks in their hands. They don't have any big gadgets, you know, no, no big toys, you know. Go, go have fun. That's like Kelvin and Hobbes, you know. They got sticks. They're killing ants. I don't know what they're doing. But, you know, in my mind, they're... Uh, they're always, you know, they're always a little, uh, my boys are great guys, but, you know, I think they probably had snot and, and dirt mixed on their faces. In my, picture them that way as I tell the story, okay? They've got a big smudges of, of, of mucus and, and, and dirt, and they're very happy children. Their faces are beaming like the sun. And so I'm underneath the, the, the car, and um, I can hear they're getting excited about something. And... They're coming over to the car. And now I'm under the car and I can see their little feet, their pajama feet under the car. And they go, Dad, they're yelling to me, Dad, come out. You got to come out and see this. We found something. I said, OK, I'll come out. I'm coming out. Come see what we found. So I get out of the car and they're running ahead of me. They're going over to the little corner of our yard. Now, this yard is it's got a hedge. It's on a fairly busy street. Got a hedge, just this little poster stamp of grass. And they're standing over something. So I walk over there. This is where I walk. This is my yard. I walk over, and I'm looking down, and they're looking at me with just disbelief on their faces. And what we have in our yard is a turtle. Now, this turtle is not a turtle like from a pet store. This is like turtle crossing type of turtle. It's a big turtle, right? This is You stop your car for turtles like this. And it's a big turtle, and it's in my yard. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell is this turtle doing in my yard? How did it get here? There's no water around our yard. And I just, like, the turtle from outer space. How'd this happen? And they are looking at me, like I just said, their faces are like the sun. This is now, our week is set. The day is all set. We're done for the day. We know what we're doing for the rest of the day. It's right here, yeah. It's not good. This is peak. We've peaked in the morning. We have a major turtle in the yard. And they start to think, before I can figure out what to do, they start hatching plants. The first thing they say is, let's take it up to mom. Let's take it in the house and show mom. No, no. Let's not take it into the house and show mom. She's not going to want this turtle in the house. Trust me, guys. <laughs> and then they're saying things like, you know, can we keep the turtle as a pet? And I'm saying, no, we can't keep the turtle as a pet because um, the turtle, this turtle doesn't want to be a pet. It wants to live outside. And then they think, again, this is crazy. My father, who was alive at the time and lived out in Michigan and a real character, they think, well, hey, grandpa loves animals. Let's get it, give it to grandpa. You know what I'm saying? No, we can't take the turtle. I think that's illegal to take this turtle to Michigan. We can't take the turtle to Michigan. So I'm thinking, okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. This turtle does not belong in our yard. I don't know what it, between you and me, I think maybe a raccoon. I'm trying to think another. This turtle did either, either did drop from a plane or some animal gave up on it, right? And just said, I'm done with this turtle. So I said, here's the plan, guys. We're gonna, I'm gonna go get a bucket and we're gonna put the turtle in the bucket. We're gonna drive down to the Charles River, which comes through Waltham. Some of you know where the Charles River is. And we're gonna liberate this turtle. We're gonna change this turtle's life. We're gonna make this turtle happy. We're gonna take it to the river. And so they're like, this is incredible. What a plan. I said, go up and tell mom, get your coats and we'll go. They run into the house. I go get a bucket. We all meet back at the turtle. Now they're standing there in their pajamas and they've got their parkas on, you know, parkas. And uh, they're looking at me. And uh, I'm thinking, I've got to tell you something about being a parent of a four and a half and a three-year-old. You know, all illusions are gone now. My, my, my kids have figured me out. But when you're four and a half and three and you're a mom or a dad, there's a small window where they really think you know what's going on. You know? They really think that you figured it all out, that you're kind of like a Superman. You know? And so my boys are looking at me like, dad's going to do the right thing. Dad knows what to do with turtles. He'll handle this well. You know? And I'm looking at the turtle, and I'm thinking, you know, I don't know a lot of adjectives. What, what adjectives come to your mind when you think of turtle? I mean, brown turtles? I don't know, brown turtles. Pond turtles? So, uh, sea turtles, yes. Snapping turtles. I'm thinking snapping turtle. That's the only thing that I remember from my turtle studies in, in eighth grade biology is snapping turtles. And so 
I don't want to spoil, you know, what I got going with my kids. They look up to me. So I'm thinking, you know, Dan, you cannot screw this up. You can't pick up the turtle and start shrieking, you know, or like, ah, or you get afraid. You got to, you can't drop the turtle. You got to pick this turtle up with confidence and put it in the bucket and make sure the kids know that we've got a plan and we're going forward. So I do, I successfully, I get it. I pick it up and now I'm feeling a little more confident. I got the turtle in the air and, you know, now it's coming up above them. The kids are like, whoa, they're looking there under the turtle and, uh, it starts doing kind of the turtle in midair thing. Before, it was just kind of a dormant turtle. Now it's doing the, you know, the, all of a sudden the legs are coming out and going back in. The head's coming out, you know. And I'm like, check it out, guys. And they're going, wow. So we've got this active turtle. We put her in the bucket. Um, and I said, let's get in the car. So they get in the car. They get in the back seat in the, in the child restraint seats, right? Those things down with a big lock right through the crotch, <laughs> you know, in their parkas. <laughs> they can't move. And I got the turtle riding shotgun up front, and she's buckled in. We start heading down to the Charles River. I'm driving, and I'm, you know, I, I just know, again, they're, they're, they're ready to, their minds are being blown. And um, I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and I can see, you know, the brain just, just the, 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 the they're just working overtime. They're just, just, just uh, their imagination is on overdrive. And they're craning their necks. Now, they can't see those, those child restraints. There's like blood coming out of their necks. They're like, ah, they're trying to see yeah, what's going on with the turtle. And so uh, you've noticed I keep calling this turtle a she. It's a she turtle. I don't know what my sons know about turtle anatomy that I don't. But... Um, the reason I'm calling it a she turtle is because the first comment that came from the back seat was a question from my son, Joey. And he, he says, Dad, what's she doing? <laughs> so I'm driving along and I said, well, uh, I'm looking in the bucket and I'm like, she, you know, I'm thinking, what the turtle's probably doing nothing. The turtle's actually doing something. The turtle was like, craw like crawling around a lot pretty actively and kept doing this thing like up the, up the wall and then sliding down. And again, I'm panicking a little because I'm thinking, oh, please, shit, don't flip over on the back because I'm going to put my hand in there, you know, while I'm driving. And I'll get bitten by a snapping turtle and scream or something. So the turtle is in there, and it's, it, it keeps going up the wall, but it keeps falling. So I said, well, it, she's just kind of, she's kind of crawling around, Joe, and she's kind of, she's, she's pretty cool, but she's, she's kind of crawling around on the, on, on the bottom of the bucket. Everything I say, they look at you and they go, wow, she's crawling around. <laughs> Crawling around on the bottom of the bucket. Yeah. Did you hear what dad said? Yeah. She's crawling around. Okay. So I'm thinking, oh, jeez. And so then um, Joe, the oldest, says again, Dad, maybe it's her first car ride. <laughs> yeah? That's probably true, Joe. I, I don't know. You guys think uh, it, that's a good point. Maybe it's the first car ride. Do you guys ever see turtles driving around in cars? No. So I think it's her first car ride. It's her first car ride. This is a girl turtle that's having her first car ride. I heard him. I did what dad said. So driving down, we got a she turtle riding shotgun, first car ride ever. And then um, uh, Julian, the younger one, says, I think thoughtfully says, maybe she's scared, dad. Maybe she's scared. I said, yeah, you know, uh, it's been quite a day for her. You're right, Joan. I mean, she's probably scared. She does. She's in a bucket. She doesn't know what's going on. You know, we're kind of big. Just a, five minutes ago, she was floating in the air. That's probably not a thing she's used to doing, you know, and now she's in a bucket. Yeah, yeah, she, she's probably a little scared. You're right, Joan. You're right. And then Julian follows up because, you know, three-year-olds are thinking about, you know, the size of the turtle and him. He says, maybe she's scared because she thinks we're giants. Yeah, that, that would make sense, Joanne, right? I mean, because, you know, because for her, we're pretty darn big, right? I mean, so she probably thinks that we're giants, you know? Yeah. They look at each other, we're like giants, like giants, those turtles. And um, Joanne says again, um, maybe she's especially scared because she thinks we're mean giants. She thinks we're mean, like monsters. And I said, yeah, I, I don't know, Joanne, it's, it's possible. She might think that we're, we're mean giants. She doesn't know. She might think we're giants. She doesn't know if we're mean or if we're good giants. That's right. So we're driving. And Joe says, but, but we're not. He says, we're not mean giants, right, Dad? We're good giants. Reassuring. I said, that's right. That's right. 
we're good giants because we're not going to hurt her. We got her best intentions. So you're right. So we've established first car ride, she turtle. We're like giants. Might be some questions on the turtle's mind whether we're good or, or bad. Then we're driving for a while and it starts to get a little quiet. And um, I'm thinking maybe the conversation's over. I'm looking in the rearview mirror. They're staring out the window. I can tell they're deep in thought still. And then my son Joe, four and a half year old, says, Hey, Dad, you know what I wish? I said, What's that, Joe? I wish that for just one minute I could be a turtle. Because then I could go into the bucket and I could talk to her in turtle language. And I could tell her, don't be afraid. We're not mean giant. I'm a good giant. You don't have to be afraid. We're not going to hurt you. I thought, yeah. I like that, Joe. That's a pretty good idea. I like that idea a lot. In this four-and-a-half-year-old's heart, what struck me was this compassion, this concern, and this creativity, right? This idea, he didn't say, I wish I could tell the turtle something. He didn't say, I wish I could get a turtle translator, you know, to help me out with this. I wish that I knew how to write in turtle. I could write a little note and put it in the bucket. What he said was, I wish I could be a turtle. I wish I could be a turtle and I could go into the bucket. Why? So that she won't be so afraid anymore. So that she'll know she can get to know me. Hey, this guy's not a bad giant. He's a good giant. He's not going to hurt me. He cares about me. And I don't know if you identify at all with that turtle in the bucket. You know, I do. I can understand what they were feeling about how she might be feeling. I sometimes feel afraid in life. I often get discouraged by what life brings to me. Sometimes feels like the ground is moving beneath my feet, you know, or my head's hitting against a wall, kind of like being in a bucket. Life is difficult. Life is really difficult. Life's a challenge. And the incredible, fantastic, and by fantastic, I mean uh, outrageous claim of Christmas. The claim that's made at Christmas is that the eternal word who has existed from all time becomes flesh and dwells among us. That, to use Joey's language, for just one minute, for just one minute in our human history, for just one minute in our evolution, the God that we know nothing about, if you believe in God, the one who is mystery, love itself, takes on flesh and shares in our humanity. Why? What's the message of incarnation? What's the message of Christmas? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm not a bad giant. I'm a good giant. I'm not bad. I'm not going to hurt you. I want the best for you. I want to be with you. You're not alone. I want you to know me. And I love you. That's the fantastic claim of Christmas. That's the the God that we encounter in the Christmas story. A God who comes to be with us, who says, you're not alone. I know you and I love you. And what I want to invite you and me to do this Christmas season is to give ourselves a little gift. And that is the gift to really think about that and to Try to believe it. And, you know, we have to acknowledge one other thing, one thing about that. There's a lot of competing voices that tell us otherwise, right? There's a lot of other voices out there that say, you should be afraid. You ought to be afraid. You should live in fear. And by the way, you're not loved. And you're alone. 
It takes a lot of discipline and hard work to filter out those messages on social media, in our politics, whatever it is. It takes discipline. And I invite you to work this Christmas to, to reject those voices and instead listen to the message of Christmas. You're not alone. You're known and you're loved. And I'm going to wish you now a very safe, healthy, really fun, fun Merry Christmas. Thanks for having me tonight.